This is Charlie Zena on April 13, 1991. Today is a special day. It's a reunion for the boys who played for Frank W. Thomas or Harold Red Drew at the University of Alabama. Today, a special treat. We have two players, one of whom played for Thomas and Drew, and the other played for Thomas. And we want to focus a little bit on Coach Thomas, but right now I'd like to introduce you to Fred Grant, to Norwood Hodges, and Fred, suppose you start by giving us a little biographical sketch. Uh, Charlie, uh, I'm from a little town called Christiansburg, Virginia, and I came to Alabama in uh, 44, 45, and 46, and fortunate enough to have played in the 45 Sugar Bowl game and in the 1946 Rose Bowl game, the last Rose Bowl game that a Southern team played in. And that year I did lead the Southeastern Conference in scoring. And uh, we had, uh, I think, probably one of Alabama's greatest football teams in 1945 or the team that played in the 46 January 146 Rose Bowl. Uh, personally, I felt Coach Thomas was one of the finest coaches that I had ever been associated with. Uh, his knowledge of the game and uh, the way he handled the players. Uh, he tied us together. He, we were a family. I think that that shows today when we get together on a reunion like this when you see uh, grown men in their 60s uh, hug each other, really seriously hug each other. And, uh, it's, it's a real family and a great friendship and, and I'd like to see us have these at least every five years <laughs> for a while anyway. Well, well yeah. stated, Fred Grant. Norwood Hodges, how about you? Where'd I, you come from? I came from Hewittown. Right. I was a 17-year-old freshman in 1944. I didn't finish high school because I had the opportunity to come to the university but as a uh, non-graduating high school student and take work in the summer to complete qualifications in our college. Strangely enough, Auburn invented this idea and uh, I was able to Alabama found out I was going to Auburn, and they said, "Well, if you can do that at Auburn, you can do it. You can do it over here." So we came. Uh, Alabama, we were on a team called the War Babies. It was after the war, and Alabama didn't have a team in '43. So we started Fred and I and our group started Fred. This was the '44 team with Harry Gilmer. Harry Gilmer, Lowell Tude, Hugh Harold Sell. It's a very, very deep today. Fred can yes, it's a very noty, notable team. And I'll tell you an interesting story about Fred. When, as I came, here we go. <laughs> go ahead, no. As I came to, in talking to Coach Thomas and Coach Burnham and Coach Laney, they said we need a fullback. Well, I had played fullback on a Notre Dame box at Hewittown. And the first day I was down here and went out to practice, I saw Fred sitting on out in the breezeway. He just had on shorts and socks pulled up, and he was a specimen of athletic talent. And, and You're I'll smiling, just, Fred, so you no doubt go I was just a little, uh, I mean, this is a true story. True story. Right. Okay. And, and, uh, and I was just a little bashful boy from Utah, but I, I did have some uh, concern about whether I could play or not. And he said, oh, yes, we, we need a pullback. That's Somebody had told me he was a fullback, and I said, "What about that boy Grant?" And Grant had played in the South, in the Southern Conference at Wake Forest the year before, and he'd been the leading scorer up there. So he was transferring to Alabama. When I asked about him, they said, "Oh, he is a halfback." We let, went out and lined up in practice, and I found out right away that Fred was a fullback. Right. And so we both jockeyed back and forth for three three years. He was number six. You were number seven, right? Yeah. Uh, that year, Alabama ran up 396 points offensively. I think after the bowl, it would add up to be 430. And you were a part of that earlier season. If I'm not mistaken, I'm going on memory. It's not in these yeah. books I have here. You scored at least 66 points yeah. for the yeah. season. Was it better than that? Uh, no, that, that was right. Well... You know, I did score the 66 points, but I think I outscored Umar probably by six points. 
and I'm sure that Harry and Norwood and uh, we had a lot of people score a tremendous amount of points and it was well and equally divided and I say fortunately uh, in fact I got my last six over Hugh in the last game we played the last game of the season I think it was against Mississippi State and uh, I caught a touchdown pass I think with uh, in the fourth quarter from Gordon Pettis uh, to go six up six up mm -hmm. on uh, mm -hmm. Hugh Marr but uh, no, the the games, uh, the bowl games, the experience of the bowl games. I, I think the uh, it's awesome when you're from a little town like Christiansburg, Virginia, or even a big city. I guess you've never played before 105,000 people, and no, you no. walk out in the Rose Bowl, and and you just stand there and look. I mean, you can't even take exercise. You stand there and you look at the height of that thing, and you look at all the people, and you, you it's hard to believe you're there. And then you see the Southern California team come out, and they outweigh the 60 pounds per man. 60? Uh, I didn't realize that. Yes, sir. Reed. Wow. Their line outweighed our line 60 pounds per man. And uh, you think, well, you know, you really got to hang in here. You're this. This is big time, big league college football, the Rose Bowl. That was it. The granddaddy of them all. And here we were. And Alabama, this was their sixth trip, and we had a lot, to, a lot to fight for, and a good record to preserve. And we were a little disappointed because I think all of us wanted to play Army. We really desperately wanted to play Army. Glenn Davis, Doc Blanchard, and uh, they had agreed prior to this that maybe Southern California would relinquish their place to Army to play, but. They shelled the coast, the Japanese submarine uh, shelled the coast a couple times, and the military would not let this game take place between Alabama and Army. And we always felt that we were equal to or better than Army, but never had that chance to prove never it. Never had a chance to prove it. Never we came in second, they were first in the national poll. And we came in poll, second right. in the national poll, although we really beat Southern California, I mean physically beat them. And Coach Thomas could have double the score, believe me. I that, think so. That's one right. game that I think we could have scored 60 points because that year we scored, I think, 60 points five or six times. But this team, they were so big and so slow, as Norwood just, just said, we didn't even have to throw. I mean, when you can go 10, 12 yards every time you carry the ball, inside, outside their tackles, mm -hmm. around their end, mm -hmm. reverses, you don't have to throw. Do you think Coach Thomas had a close rapport with the team as a whole, or did he come off uh, being somewhat distant? Uh? Yeah, Coach Thomas, looking in retrospect just a little bit, he was brilliant. I've heard it said by a lot of knowledgeable people that he was a t brilliant tactician. He was a great coach on the field. Uh, he was a great teacher, uh, but the personal relationship, every coach has a different. Coach Thomas was a hard person to feel close to. But I remember the time, that one particular day, we played somebody and we lost. But he could work you so hard and, and challenge you so much that, that when you did win, you'd hate him during the week. But when you won or you played a good game and he didn't have to do anything but come by and just pat you on the shoulder and say, good game, you'd feel like a, oh, yeah. you'd feel like a hero. Yeah, that's and, uh, Red, how did you find Coach Thomas personality-wise? Uh, you were kind of outspoken and jolly good fellow and this sort of thing, and sometimes he might stare at you a little bit differently than he stares at some of the others, but how did you find it? Well, Coach Thomas and I had a, a, a very good personal relationship. Uh, he did know my name, and he did call me often to come into the office because <laughs> he did know <laughs> he did know that I did know what was going on with that football team. But uh, I found him to be a, uh, a real psychiatrist-type coach. Well, uh, in fact, I learned a lot from this man in my days as a coach. Uh, I used a lot of his tactics. He wanted, he wanted to be respected. He was the head coach, and that he got across to all of us. He was the head coach, and his word was final, and he made all final decisions but he was not the whipping boy 
he delegated that responsibility to Coach Chris, just to Coach just Bostic, to come and, and to browbeat or to put you on the spot or to nail you to the wall or tell you that we are going to fire you or we're going to ship you home or we're going to do so and so. Coach Thomas never got involved in that. He never was the bad guy. He always wore the white hat until the final decision had to be made. You never were confronted with Coach Thomas. Now, he would look at you, and you knew something was going to happen. And you knew he didn't like you at that particular point in time, that day or that morning or during practice. But he would just turn to Blue and say, Coach, keep Grant or Hodges after practice for a few minutes. That, and you knew, man, <laughs> he had spoken. <laughs> now, what is your most uh, outstanding memories of your football career at the University of Alabama? I guess the one most exciting moment was, we'd heard something about going to Rose Bowl, but it wasn't, news wasn't quick moving, fast moving then like it is now. So all it was was a rumor. I remember driving to Birmingham, just crossing over the bridge at Best and I, and I got caught to speed. Stopped, and the cops stopped, the policemen stopped. I was listening to the radio and it was announced that Alabama had just been chosen to go to the Rose Bowl. But about that time, the policemen stopped. And I said, Sir, I, I have to tell you, I'm so excited right now, I don't know. And, and you uh, tell him why you're excited? I told him I had, yeah, and he said, Well, go ahead. So I turned around and went back <laughs> on. Roll the tide. It was a. How about you, Fred? What is your most fond memory you can recall in your football career in Alabama? Well, I, I think uh, my high, it had to be my high, uh, I was game captain of the last game we played in 1945. And with that game, we uh, had the opportunity to be selected to go to the Rose Bowl. But walking out on the field, we knew we had to win to do this. And you knew you had to win good, huh? Yes. Okay. Uh, we were in the running. But as Norwood said, we we wouldn't know for a while. Right. And the first uh, the first thing that Mississippi State did uh, had a great quarterback. I believe it was Shorty McWilliams. Uh, we kicked off to them, and they marched right down to about our 20 yard line, somewhere along our 20 yard line. And he dropped back and uh, to pass, and we backed out on pass defense, and he threw the ball to an end that looked like he was open on an up and out somewhere around the 18 yard line. And I would just happen to be back in perfect position. And I just stepped in front of that end and picked that ball off and went 87 yards. <laughs> All the way. <laughs> All the way. And I was happy. <laughs> you remember the final score? Uh, 21-6, 21-7. Yeah. I thought 28. Uh, it wasn't really close. I don't I must confess here, I'm reading from the book, 55 to 13. Okay. That's why I say you got the message. Yeah, you had we to, you right. had to okay. win real yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, we beat them, beat them pretty bad. That team, our team that year, somebody last night was calling off statistics about the yards gained offensively. Yeah, Vaughn. The yards Vaughn defensive. Was, yeah. That team had a number of records, like holding the team to the least first downs, making the most first downs on offense. Right. Uh, the, holding the other team on third down. Yeah. This is 45 team. Down. This is 45 yeah, 40 team. Yeah. Least number of points scored against an Alabama team. 80. Uh, Only 80 points scored. Yeah. It was a, and, and that's another highlight in, in my memory is that the team had so much unity. It was a, you know, we, we really we were young and eager, and we saw beginning of the next year we saw a little bit of an influx of new players. New thoughts, a little, maybe like Coach Long today, today was talking about maybe the intensity of some of the guys today were not right. like it used to be. Well, you know, we had a group there that one time it had the all intensity in the world, and as it began to change, maybe some of it wasn't there. So when we had it, that was a great feeling. I mean, that was like, man, you know, we, we're the champions. Well, I'd like to make an observation there too, Norwood, so right because ahead. I'll tell you two things that impressed me about that ball club, and I don't think many other teams uh, probably have, have that. We had, we were four deep 
Now this is the truth. We were four deep in most positions. And those boys playing second and third could have played first string at a number of the schools that we played without any difficulty at all. And to, to make that point even stronger, we all love to play the game on Saturday. It was like a vacation, Charlie, because our practices were so intent. We hit. I mean, Norwood wanted to play against Tennessee Saturday, and he hit, and I wanted to play. I didn't care whether Norwood played or not. I wanted to play against Tennessee. My family's coming right. from Virginia. Right. And uh, there were two people behind us, Red Noon and... Uh, and a couple other fullbacks that we thought were almost equally as good. And if Norwood had a, a bum knee for two days that week, he might end up four string. Right. Or if I did my ribs, which I did, I cracked my ribs. You know, I don't play in that game because there are people out there, but we hit so hard and so intense. And I've said many a time that our blocking for the passer and blocking for the punter, when Bob Hood and Rebel Steiner and these other ends over there were coming in on you, they wanted to play first team. And our practices were so tough that come Saturday, man, it was just like a, it was like a big celebration. There was no team as, as tough as us. Right. And, and you know, it made, it made playing a pleasure. On this special Thomas Drew reunion weekend at the University of Alabama, we've been interviewing Norwood Hodges, Fred Grant. Both played on the 1946 January 1st Rose Bowl team. They played on the 1945 undefeated untied team. And as you have heard, some very, very interesting stories. But always in these interviews, I have a feeling that some people walk away and say, well, I wish he had asked me thus and so, or he didn't mention this, or he didn't mention that. So in case that is even halfway true today, let me give you an opportunity to pull one out of the hat, so to speak, as we wind down. I think the most significant factor was the opportunity to go to, to come to school at the University of Alabama. To play for Coach Thomas, who mentioned his background, who played for Newt Rockman. Um, the opportunity to be with these boys on a winning record uh, and, and, and be recognized like we were was a real exciting thing. Uh, when I got my eligibility was up after four years. I still like two years of graduate. I'm not proud of that, but I went to Coach Thomas and I was fixing to get married and I, and I talked with him about it. He said, well, I'm going to give you a scholarship, continue your scholarship till you graduate. I came back, went to school full time those two years and coached. So he encouraged you to come he back? He encouraged me to come back and he made it possible by giving him a scholarship. So that's the of everything that ever happened to be to graduate after being in that void of being here four years, and it wasn't all. Uh, it was a combination of things. Why? But needless to say, I would, if I just gone on, I wouldn't have graduated. So when, when I graduated, I had a tremendous amount of pride. It, I've been. It's been my joy, and, and I think a, a real benefit. And what we learned about sacrifice and winning and sharing is uh, it's worked very well in, in, in my personal life and I think those lives that I've influenced. Today we dedicated the so-called indoor facility, sort of an in indoor practice field, to coach Hank Crisp. Until now, I, unless my memory is failing, we haven't mentioned Coach Crisp in this interview. We talked about Coach Thomas, we talked about Coach Drew, we talked about Coach Bryant. What do either of you or both of you have to say along those lines on Coach <coughs> Chris? Did you know him well? Uh, do you have some comment uh, that you care to make? Well, Coach Drew, I mean Coach uh, Chris, was away in the service when, when we came to school. And I don't think he came back coaching until uh, several years later. Yeah, he, he, uh, he was at Tulane part of the time yeah. uh, on one but the, you're right. He did his uh, the uh, respect and the, is it all the players that had ever known him. He was really the godfather of Alabama football up until that period of time. I I had a special place in my heart for Coach Hank because he went to VPI 
which is right. seven miles from Christiansburg, Virginia. Right. And I grew up in the shadows of VPI, Virginia Tech. That's Blacksburg. Blacksburg, Virginia, right. seven miles from Christiansburg, mm -hmm. Montgomery right. County. Uh, I grew up with one burning desire, go to VPI, play football at Virginia Tech. But when it was time for me to go to VPI and play football, uh, the war broke out, and uh, they had uh, gone strictly to the military program at VPI, and they were not taking any civilians, and uh, they weren't going to play football that year. And I was a, a, a freshman and hadn't really been drafted, and I hadn't gone to the draft board yet to be examined. I was 17, too. So uh, I was trying to get a scholarship to a civilian football team college at the time, and that's that's how I happened to end up at Wake Forest. But Coach Hank played at VPI, and uh, I knew about Coach Hank way before I knew he was at Alabama because of the legend at VPI. He lettered in three sports, and with the one arm, he played baseball, basketball, and football and lettered at VPI. Fred and Norwood, Fred Grant, Norwood Hodges, let me, Charlie Zena, thank you on behalf of the Paul Bryant Museum for this oral history interview. It's been most interesting indeed. Appreciate you giving the time. And I know it's fun to be back for the Thomas Drew reunion, right? Right. Yes. Roll Tide. Roll, Roll Tide. tide.